probability for a photon to get to the screen at any given point is the sum of the probabilities for it to get there by either route. So the result is, in classical physics, you would always see the signal over here, the profile over here, just being the sum of the two probability distributions. Clueless. Father Knows Best, next on So What. Hi, I'm Chris Dorman. And I'm Don Waite. Welcome back to So What? We are continuing our series, Father Knows Best. We're looking at the providence of God. Now, you recall that we started the series by talking about, by defining providence, and then the importance of the, of the Word of God, because everything we're going to talk about, the providence of God, comes from the Scriptures. What God has declared of Himself about His plans and purposes. And we said the reason why we struggle so much, we have so much anxiety, is because we're not sure what the Word teaches, we don't really, really believe it's the Word of God, and we also doubt the character of the God who has made these pronouncements. Right. So we looked at the Scriptures, and we, the Scriptures are the Word of God, period. And last week we started looking at the character of the God who has made these promises, who has made these pronouncements right. and these commitments to us. And we saw last week that our God is good. And that means that for His people, yeah. for those who call upon Christ as Lord and Savior, you always know, in the worst of circumstances, your God is working for two ends primarily, His glory and your good. Your good meaning your transformation, your sanctification, the yes. conformity of you to Christ's image. That's what He's doing. You can bank on that. That is your hope. That is your anchor, as Don said. Right. Your God is good. And you must believe that. It's a belief that must be as impregnable <laughs> as the go. throne of God, according to Tozer. And Tozer said our moral sanity depends on ascribing to God perfect goodness. But Tozer also said our moral sanity depends on ascribing to God something else. And that's what we want to look at today. Yeah. What was he talking about? Our God is an infinitely wise God. Mm -hmm. He knows what he's doing. That's right. I mean, what does it mean to have wisdom? Yeah. Many of you have seen people in your lives that when you look at them, you see them is having some things figured out that they have some nuggets of truth or wisdom that you like to learn from and, and rightfully so because many times most of the time Chris they have great life experience most of them have been around a little longer than you right it could be that the 10 year old is looking up to the 18 year old it could be that the 18 year old's looking up to the 30 year old and it could be that the 30 year old is really looking toward the 80 some year old guy going he's he's got something to say I think I should sit down and listen yeah right because those life experiences right. tend to breed wisdom and again what is wisdom yeah so how how is okay how is how does wisdom differ from knowledge Don wisdom would be the practical application of the knowledge I have mm. How do I use the knowledge I have in a way that benefits myself or those around me from a human perspective? Mm -hmm. Right? We're not talking about God's wisdom right. now. We're talking about my wisdom. Right. So wisdom would tell me I probably should turn off the power to the house before I start doing stuff with the wiring. Mm -hmm. Now, what informed that wisdom? It could be that I tried to do it before <laughs> I had done that and got myself zapped. Yeah. Right? So I learned something. Yeah, that's right. Right? I knew this kid once in, when I was in high school. He was 13 years old, 14 years old, and he was so much smarter than me. Oh my gosh. <laughs> Brett was his name. And he, well, it's still his name. <laughs> Brett is his name. And, and Brett was really, really smart. Mm -hmm. And, and he, he, really, he really made me feel dumb. And he wasn't prideful about it. He wasn't trying to make me feel dumb. It's just when he would speak, and he, would just, he was just a smart kid. 
he was just a really, really smart kid, but the, the kid had no common sense at all. <laughs> I mean, he would do the dumbest things, the most absent-minded things. <laughs> you know, he'd put on his he'd put on his shirts backwards. He his his um, his shorts or pants would be on inside out. Oh, no. He would have mismatched oh, no. socks, and he was not colorblind. He was just absent-minded. He was his head was always just thinking about all this stuff, but he but he, he couldn't live life. He couldn't function. He really, really couldn't function as he got older and started to drive. Oh my gosh! Oh my gosh! Gosh. <laughs> oh my gosh! He was terrible. He was terrible. He had all the brains in the world, but but he couldn't use that knowledge to really function. And and the truth is, in a lot of ways, he was clueless. Right. He really, really was. And and when we're looking at God's wisdom, hmm. we're looking at the fact that our God knows the very best means to achieve the very most perfect ends. Wow. And what he does is the best that can be done. That there's not a better way to do it. And this is where we get tripped up, beloved, because how many times in the throes of agony, or trial, whatever it is, you go, God, why? Couldn't you have done it like this? And when you think that way, it's like that opening video. It's like trying to explain physics to a newborn. It's for it to get there by either route. The newborn can, cannot comprehend physics. It doesn't mean the physics aren't true. It's just the baby lacks understanding. Fascinating. And when we, finite creatures, infinitesimally small in comparison to the great and mighty God that we serve, it's the same thing. We don't know anything. In the grand scheme of things, we don't. Right. Our problem is we think we do. We're clueless, but we don't know it. And we just simply won't believe it. So again, God is wise. God is ultimately the wise God that we serve. The scriptures declare him to be wise, and we should look at that. Let's, yeah. let, let's look at some scriptures that of verses. talk about God sure. being wise. Because again, that's what this is about, right? This is what God has declared of himself. Job 12, 13, with him, with God, are wisdom and might. To him belong counsel and understanding. Psalm 146, uh, verse 5, great as our Lord and mighty in power, his understanding or his wisdom has no limit. Romans 16, 27, to the only wise God through Jesus Christ be the glory forever. Amen. Uh, Isaiah 40, verse 28. Do you not know? Have you not heard? The Lord is the everlasting God, the creator of the ends of the earth. He will not grow tired or weary, and his understanding no one can fathom. Man. That is our God. And there's lots more verses, and I'll... There's lots more verses about that. But, but the point is, is our God alone is wise. He alone knows what's best. Our Father knows what's best. And this is part of his providential plan, right? It's all, it, it, they're not independent. Mm -hmm. I mean, God has perfect understanding. He has the end from the beginning. He has it all in his mind. Why? Yes. Because he is the God of providence who is bringing it all to pass. That's right. He is not sitting back with his hands going, I don't know what to do <gasps> oh, next. No. Right? God's got a purpose of what he's doing. His perfect knowledge then is applied with perfect wisdom exactly. to achieve the most perfect ends. Right. And what are those ends in the end of the day? What are those ends, Chris? God's glorification, the exaltation of his name, and our sanctification. That's what God is doing. Our and sanctification, i.e. our good. Our highest, our highest good, good is to be made more like Jesus Amen. Christ. Amen. Right? That's right. Re remember that at the end of the day, when God created humans, he created them in his image. In his image, he created them both, male and female, and it was very good. And then at the fall, there was a marring of the human condition. And now through redemption in Christ, we are in a process called sanctification to make us more and more like Christ. And he redeems us. And remember when we were talking about who are we in the series, who are mm -hmm. we? We are a work of art yeah. that God is forming in us, Jesus. Yeah. So that highest good means that God is going to use the best means then to make me more like Jesus, to make you more like Jesus. Yes. Yeah. But that can be hard. <laughs> to the extent you believe that is to the extent that you can be content, whatever mm. your circumstances are. But you know, 
What's hard about that is when we look at goodness, when we look at desired ends, our, what I want in my life many times isn't congruent with what God is doing. And, we, and so we start to question his wisdom and his goodness because that's not the way I would do it and that's not what I want because it's frankly hard. It hurts. Painful, right? Difficult. Embarrassing. I mean, there's so many things. You run the gamut of emotions in life with all the tragedy and, and brokenness in the world, Chris. God, couldn't you have achieved your ends by doing this instead? Couldn't, wouldn't, you know, it would have been a whole lot easier for me if you just would have. And beloved, we all think that way at one right. point or another. We do. <laughs> we do. We do. I shared with you last week that I just about shipwrecked my faith when I questioned the goodness of God. Because I, I, I started to look at the things happening in my life and go, how can this be good? Mm. It just can't be good because it hurts so much. And then when I did that, I said, well, okay, so if God may not, if God isn't perfectly good, then he can't be perfectly wise. And as I began to doubt the wisdom of God and the goodness of God, then it was a free fall. Yeah. It was. It was a free fall. I had, no, I had no foundation anymore to stand on the promises of God because if God's not good and if God's not wise, why would I believe his promises? And how, how do I know with certainty that he's using the very best means to achieve the very best ends? I don't know that anymore. So then, then what do I have to do? I've got to be Adam and Eve. I've got to look out for myself. I've got to find my own happiness. I've got to find my own joy. I've got to find my own purpose. And that purpose was feeling better at whatever cost. Man, you brought up some And it all it. starts with doubting the God, God's goodness and wisdom. See, then it was a spiritual free-for-all. Free-fall and free-for-all. Right? Because at the end of the day, your highest good in your mind was your happiness Feeling better. and contentedness. Feeling better. Yeah, and to, and, and to get away from the pain. And it's all understandable, and it's all perfectly rational, and yes. yet it's not what God Immoral. teaches us. It's wrong, it's sin, it's wicked. It, it, could it be that God uses the most dire and horrible circumstances in our lives to achieve the best ends for us? And that's not a rhetorical question. That, there, that's a real, there's a real answer, and the answer is yes every time. Yes and amen. Look at the life of Job. So one of the questions that I think, you know, I had as a young believer that really was, it was very difficult for me to understand what the place of the book of Job actually was in the Bible. Like, yeah. why did we have this story, this agony that this man was going through in these supposed friends that were bringing all kinds of accusations against him? And it really was difficult, honestly, Chris, for me to see a purpose yeah. in the book when I was a young man. Yeah, me too. Me too. In fact, if you, in fact, this is the Bible I had way back when. Mm -hmm. I got this during pastoral studies, <laughs> Sanctuary South Bay days. Remember the Thompson Chain reference, NIV? That's what this is, friends. And if you look, Eliphaz, Bildad, and, and Zophar, I, I, I highlighted a bunch of stuff that they said. A bunch of stuff that they said about condemning sin and, and don't bad things happen to people who sin. I highlighted all of that stuff because it's true. Many of the things that they said were absolutely true. The problem is they didn't apply to Job. <laughs> what they said was true. It just didn't apply to Job. But it didn't answer the question of suffering in Job's Why life. Why was Job suffering? Right. So maybe let's take a step backward, as they like to say, because maybe some people are watching that aren't super familiar. But here's the deal. It, it, here's the cliff notes that you need to understand. Job was brought up by the Lord himself to Satan and said, Have you concern, considered my servant Job? God had a purpose from the very beginning to do something in Job's life. And part of that was suffering. And you say, Oh my gosh, why would God do that? Well, again, wisdom would dictate for his own glory and for the good of Job. But how could good come from a man who then, as we see in the first chapters, getting all of his children taken from him, all of his livelihood taken from him, all of his health taken from him, and he was miserably, miserably sick. And none of this stuff was repairable. You couldn't just fix it. Like, So where is the wisdom of God and the goodness of God in that? And so he starts going, well, what's going what's on? What's going and, on, God? And he had wonderful friends, to be fair, that came and sat with him for like a week Seven days. and didn't say a single thing. Good friendship. Then it started to fall down. <laughs> Because they started saying things like, you must have done something to make this happen. Because in, because in their minds, it was inexplicable. Because in their minds, bad things happen to bad people. Therefore, Job, right. you must not be righteous. There must be sin somewhere in your life, and, and God's punishing you because of it. Or they, God punished your children. Your children were wicked, and therefore, they had to be punished, mm -hmm. and God killed all ten of them 
in a day, in the same day, because they were wicked. And Job knew that that wasn't true. Right. Job knew it wasn't true. And as he, as he defended himself, he got more and more angry and frustrated, and the pain grew deeper and deeper and deeper. And he's just questioning God, why, why, why? And then he demands an audience with God. Right. Now, how would you, knowing that someone has lost their livelihood, they've lost their children, they've lost their health, what would you want to say to that person in their moment of deepest anguish? Probably not what God said. <laughs> Put his arm around Job and said, Who is this that darkens my counsel with words without knowledge? In other words, who's this idiot who's questioning me? Right. Right. That, that was God's comfort to Job. Out of the whirlwind, God of, spoke. <laughs> so remember, remember, remember Elihu who spoke at the end. He waited to speak because he was the youngest. And he was waiting for age, mm -hmm. wisdom to speak. Mm -hmm. Okay, he was waiting for wisdom to speak. Well, God, in his in his speech, in God's speech, starting in Job thirty eight, God is essentially saying, "I'm eternal. I've always been here." Okay, and therefore, I'm the wisest there is. He says, "Where were you when I did these things? Right. Do you know why it rains? Do you know why it doesn't rain? Why, when the lion's looking for food, how are they satisfied with food? Because I give it to them." Where not, were you when I laid the foundations of the earth? Yeah. Tell me, you're so wise. Tell me all these things that you know. Tell me. Now, he doesn't say, you know, Job, there's a good purpose in what I'm doing here. I want you to know that I'm humbling Satan right now. And I'm bringing glory to myself through your sacrifice. I'm doing that. My name is being exalted. My fame is being spread. And this story, your story, will bless millions of people for generations. That's what I'm doing right now. God never does that. No. He never answers the question of why. God simply declares that I am wise and you are not. That's God's defense. And what is Job's response? <laughs> I spoke of things I didn't understand, right. things too wonderful for me to know. I repent. I despise myself and I repent in dust and ashes. So he repents. He's not repenting of sin nope. that caused his calamity. He's he repenting didn't. of the sin of questioning God, God and his wisdom and also demanding that God give him an answer that honestly none of us have a right to. It's by God's grace when we have at least some sense of what God might be doing beyond those large ideas that we know from Scripture, his glory and our good at being yeah. made into the image of Jesus. But all those specific things that many times we have questions about, Chris, this side of glory, we may never have an answer. May not. We may not. It may be that God says, you know what? I'm going to put a thorn in your flesh and my grace will be sufficient for you and that's all you need to know. And, and, and how do you abide in that? Because you know I'm good and you know I'm wise. Those two things. And you can abide no matter what. Now, how does this relate to our series mm -hmm. on providence? As we explore the scriptures, as we dive deeply into what God has declared of himself and his plans and purposes and the extent of his providential rule in his creation, there may come a time when you wonder and you doubt and you question, well, if God is, is so sovereign, if God is in such control, then why is this happening to me? This can't be good. This can't be wise. And then you'll call back to the scriptures and the scriptures say, yes, he is good. And yes, he is wise and it is the word of God. And therefore, it is an anchor. Yes. And I can stand on it. Even if I don't understand what's going on around me. My God is good. And my God knows what he's doing. When we say God is wise, we say, we're, all we're saying is God has a clue. God knows what he's yeah, doing. He's God not, has a clue. He is not clueless like I am. The, look, the world is crazy right now. It's running amok. We're clueless about what God is doing many times. We are. We don't know exactly what's happening. We have large picture ideas, but we don't know the wisdom and what's unfolding before our eyes. But we can't question his goodness any more than I question the Trinity is true because That's I know right. that the scriptures declare it to be true. Therefore, I believe it. it. And, and, and so I'm going to be settled and resolute in that even though... Life is crazy, and the world is crazy. But shouldn't it be? I mean, sin came into the world, and it's broken. Should it all just be working like a finely tuned and well-oiled machine? Or should it be falling apart at the seams? Well, it kind of is. The fact of the matter is God's holding it together. In his great wisdom, he's got things working out toward his great ends. And to the extent you believe that is to the extent you're going to be content 
no matter what your circumstances. And it will dictate whether or not you see Romans 8.28 as a, as a cruel joke or maybe one of the greatest, most comforting words ever spoken. Right. God works for the good for those who love him and are called to according to his purposes. All things for good. Because our Father really does know best. And he's wise. Thank you for tuning in, my friends, and I'll talk to you next week. We'll talk to you soon.